All right. This works. How are people feeling? Are we in the afternoon? Are people still awake? Do we need to do a stretch? All right, all right, we're good. Also, I check and make sure all the mics work. Uh, Here's one. one. Yeah. All right, so to end the day, we'll be talking about real world assets, what that possibly means. I think there's actually a lot of discussion. We were talking in the back of, wait, how are we actually each defining real world, real world assets? Each of us defines it differently. So we're going to talk about that. Really excited to have an exciting group of folks here. So starting from that side, we have Carlos Arena, um, Asad Khan, Sanjay Raghavan, and Michael Mezzatesta. Uh, Anna, Anna Lerner couldn't make it, so Michael's filling in. Uh, so yeah, we'll go ahead and start. I'll let them do intros, and we'll go from there. So Carlos, go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Carlos Arena. I'm a director of digital assets at Google Cloud. At Google Cloud, um, we would like to be the prime or the first choice for uh, Web3 development um, for both founders and uh, builders. And our main focus is to actually make it easy and take some of the uh, complexities to deploy and maintain blockchain uh, networks. Uh, to democratize uh, blockchain data, and also to promote best practices for us to have a much easier experience when facing multiple protocols and different uh, infrastructures uh, to store it. Hello, my name is Asad Khan. I work at Centrifuge. Uh, we're an on-chain securitization protocol. We were the first to bring real-world assets to MakerDAO. I do protocol partnerships. Sometimes they call me the DeFi politician because I have to work with DAOs. You guys know how fun that is. And yeah, congratulations to you guys for staying to the end. I promise this will be the most informative panel, so you're welcome. Wow, that's a tough one to beat. Uh, I'm Sanjay Raghavan, head of Web3 at Roofstock. Um, we're a prop tech player, um, big in the single family rental space, and the Web3 division is essentially using uh, NFT technologies to facilitate the instantaneous sale and settlement of uh, rental properties using um, uh, the Ethereum blockchain. and. We also work with uh, DeFi protocols through which we can bring leverage for these assets on chain. Um, so largely simplifying what's traditionally a three to six week process to close a property, um, pretty much doing it near instantaneously, just a few minutes to um, become a property owner. Hey everyone, I'm Michael Mezzatesta, I'm head of growth at the Climate Collective. We are a coalition of organizations that are advocating on behalf of the entire blockchain climate movement, so kind of pulling together all of the organizations that are working on climate applications of Web3 technology and uh, really trying to build credibility in, the, in that space for blockchain technology, which we truly believe has a lot to offer for the fight against climate change. And I'll do a quick intro of myself as well. So Nikhil Raghavira, uh, Head of Strategy and Innovation at the Celo Foundation, which supports the development of the Celo blockchain. Celo is a layer one blockchain, EVM compatible, primarily a mobile architecture with a heavy emphasis also around kind of real world financing as well as climate. So first question, maybe we'll start with Assad because you actually had written an article on this. What are real world assets? Yeah, I think it's a great question. I'm actually curious to hear the rest of the panel's uh, answer as well, but I wrote this article on The Defiant, just kind of having fun with the term. Real world assets is like the biggest buzzword right now. Everyone's talking about it, no one really knows what it is. And I think really it's about kind of what's always been at the heart of this industry, finding productive use cases for blockchain and crypto technologies. And you know, whether it's real estate or carbon credits or something in emerging markets, right? Pure digital assets in the cloud, I think it's really about how can you use kind of the structures and mechanics that decentralized finance and crypto asset networks have shown us to create you know, integrations with the real systems and real things of value, the places and where people actually like, you know, live and die based on the results of, right? I think that's, that's it for me, but I'm curious to hear the rest of the panel too. On my end, there's um, primarily based on the work that we have done, it's, it's a lot of like um, financial use cases. And in some cases, you think uh, you know, digitizing a bond is, is just something stupid. You don't necessarily need a blockchain um, or potentially, I mean, you do in regards to like efficiencies, uh, reduce the settlement window, um, 
reduce some of the counterparty risk, et cetera, et cetera. At the same time, current capital markets today are extremely efficient. So why do we want to um, just move them into a digital format? And what has been really, really interesting is to actually proof that you could actually move um, you know, from a paper-based type of um, system to one that is digital uh, and what is needed for you to convert. Not only bonds that we can do easily today, but hopefully in the future we'll have the technology behind it to actually uh, innovate into multiple type of assets that currently uh, cannot be securitized today. So I'm very, very excited in regards, for example, for collateral management. We all know what collateral is. It's really, really hard to post collateral. It's really hard to claim collateral and also use that collateral to lend it again. So how can we improve the collateral management by making it digital and truly atomic, i.e. Uh, transaction settles if my collateral comes in and doesn't settle if it doesn't. Um, we can talk about the uh, tokenization of securities, but also what needs to happen in regards to regulation and which regulation uh, needs to uh, change for that to, to move forward. Uh, we can talk about um, rights or royalties that have not been securitized today that will be in the future. So net new assets with new technology, um, again, with the backing of the financial uh, aspect and financial uh, regulatory framework. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd, I'd concur with you. Uh, any asset in the real world that either has its own intrinsic value or it has the ability to generate future cash flows potentially is a target to be, uh, you know, secu uh, either tokenized or securitized, whatever is the word you want to use, brought into Web3 uh, and be uh, termed as a real world asset. Now, in the past, though, there's been a lot of uh, debate about what really uh, makes up real world assets because a couple of years back, if you were trying to look at TVL of real world assets on DeFi, you know, there were big numbers being floated, and a lot of that was um, protocols like Maple and others that were essentially lending to uh, funds that are crypto hedge funds. Um, and the only criteria for being real world assets was that these funds had a legal entity with an EIN. So if you lent them money, it was considered real world assets, but really all that was happening was uncollateralized crypto lending, right? So if I remove those aspects of what was previously touted as real world assets and talk about the real real world assets, right? Like the tangible assets like real estate and like you were saying, receivables, uh, trade finance, um, royalties, uh, IP, like when you bring those things into the blockchain, I think that will be the new definition of real world assets as we go forward. Yeah, and, and one of those use cases that we're very focused on at the Climate Collective is, is real world assets that represent digital digital versions of environmental assets. So that would mean a tokenized version of a carbon credit or a carbon offset. That's like probably the most common use case in our space. Um, but also thinking about like how do you have a digital asset that represents something like biodiversity in a, in a protected area? Like what would that look like? How can you digitize it and trade it um, is sort of the, the use case we think about. And the idea is that if you can tokenize or digitize some of these real world assets that are environmental, that are backed by natural capital, like actual trees and forests, then it will allow more capital to funnel into environmental preservation and conservation. Um, and so we, we see it as a way to unlock new sources of finance for um, any, any, any behavior that is positive for the climate. So I do actually want to give you a chance to go a little bit deeper on that, because I think you have we have three other panelists who just went into the financial components of it, which is probably more DeFi-oriented, right? I think most folks are quite familiar with decentralized finance, the structures around that, whether you know that's protocols such as Aave or Uniswap, MakerDAO, um, even like Centrifuge and things like that. But I think in your case, Michael, you're actually talking about something a little different, particularly around this idea around regenerative finance or refi. Mm -hmm. So maybe a little bit of context there might be helpful too. Yeah, would it be helpful to explain what, what refi is? Yes. Um, okay, so. So if we take one step back and think about the current economic system and, and how it works today, um, the things that have value are often tied to some level of financial return, which is represented by you know, economic growth and, and uh, the value of, say, the, the consumption or production of assets, um, often measured in GDP, right? And that's kind of the, what it all boils down to. Um, but the problem with that, and something that climate scientists and economists have been thinking a lot about, is 
um, the fact that externalities are not priced into the current economic system, and that's led us to the, the current situation with the climate. So the idea is what would, a, what would a different version of an economic system look like that actually values regeneration of natural capital so that it's not external, external uh, externalized by the system, and so that's kind of the foundational question of regenerative economics, and then regenerative finance kind of brings the principles of finance and DeFi into that question as well, and says what happens if we actually start to tokenize and 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 kind of create assets out of some some environmental um, you know assets and and actually give them the chance to be um, traded and. We believe that you know, by making them digital, you can actually increase the transparency of these markets. And carbon markets already kind of existed, right? Like there, there have been carbon offsets and carbon credits for the last 30 years. But the advances in digital technology and DeFi have allowed us to kind of tokenize things and bring them on chain and also make them more transparent. And hopefully that will not only increase the credibility of the entire market, but also, like I said before, access a ton of new forms of capital. Cool, perfect, thanks. No problem. So now I think, all right, so you guys have each given a hypothetical view of how you see uh, real world assets. Each of you is doing different types of work as it relates to that. Uh, so maybe we'll start, uh, maybe, yeah, with Carlos, if you want to start and talk about how you're particularly working with real world assets in your kind of day to day or what, or how you're basically envisioning that uh, culminating. Yeah, Google Cloud has been basically to provide the foundation as to what infrastructure is required for you to have an application or a solution that can scale and can get to a billion users. Um, what is the storage? What's the compute? What's the networking that would be necessary? So no matter what the asset is, it's more what infrastructure is, would be required for you to achieve that. Uh, we're working and pushing the boundaries in regards to optimization on, on, on compute, optimization on, on storage, but also just improving networking to go from a B2B today to a B2C and C2C down, uh, down the road. Uh, and what is needed technology and infrastructure wise for you to achieve that. Um, at the end of the day, uh, some people before talked about you know, having a, a validator in your cell phone that is still a stretch. Um, and we are trying to work those uh, technology challenges to actually achieve that. So we do believe that there's multiple use cases, uh, both you know, real world assets or traditional assets that will be digitized, but an infrastructure that is um, needed for you to have building users with scalable, reliable, and secure type of um, networking and, and, and um, processing uh, is something that is still to be uh, worked on, and that's something that we're focusing on. Yeah, so centrifuge is interesting because we have kind of two major focuses, right? The first is if you look at the world of traditional financing for like everyday business commercial loans, it's completely inefficient for small businesses. The rates of finance, the access liquidity that they have, the, the yield that they're required to pay is you know, pretty much astronomical compared to the largest companies in the world. So it's a very inefficient system from that perspective. It's, it's very unequal, I guess is one way to say it. So there's a large portion of what we're doing which is trying to address that opportunity. And that's really about private credit and private structured credit, because you think about how do you scale private credit, you have to put it through something called a securitization, and you know, that involves tranches and investors, and it becomes very complex, very opaque, lots of Excel spreadsheets, tons of consulting fees. And so on one angle, we're just trying to say, can we use blockchain technology to solve that problem? On the other hand, we're a DeFi protocol. You know, we are a DAO or a protocol. We really believe in the ethos of kind of crypto and the original kind of idea of developing like sovereign protocols, right? So there's another part of it where it's, we have this huge inefficient market in traditional finance. How can we bring that market into the on-chain ecosystem? So you know, we started working with MakerDAO. It's a DAI stablecoin. They had an obvious need to expand into real-world assets. We did so successfully there. Maker has since expanded into you know, other assets and built kind of a whole you know, vertical within their organization that's able to do that. And we kind of think about the rest of the DeFi world, like the DeFi market, if you will, how can we connect the traditional conventional credit markets into the world of DeFi so that there are benefits, more stable yield, take advantage of the demand that's there, and also, you know, going back to what I said, solving productive real world problems, which I think is a theme throughout this conversation today. Um, so, you know, we're very narrowly focused on the single-family rental asset class in the U.S. 
Um, and that's, by the way, it's $4 trillion of value. There's about 20 million rental units, uh, and these could be any, um, you know, buildings that have just a single detached unit all the way to duplexes, triplexes, and quadplexes, right? So uh, if you take these one to four units, there's 20 million of these as rental units in the U.S. Um, the traditional process of buying and selling these properties is extremely unpleasant. Um, it takes weeks to close a property, um, and during those weeks, both the buyer and seller are very stressed out because there's half a dozen different contingencies on the offer. Uh, they can go back and renegotiate on those at any time for any number of reasons that come up while you're diligencing the asset during the uh, closing period. And there's um, tons of intermediaries. Some of them are obvious and you'll know about them because you're working with them. But when you look at the HUD statement, um, there'll be like 50 line items there with costs associated with it, and you, you'd be wondering, like, who are these people? I never interacted with any of them, but they're all taking a fee on this transaction, right? So we set out to make that process just ridiculously simple, and the way we did that was by titling a rental property into a single-purpose limited liability company and associating an, an NFT with the sole ownership of that LLC. So instead of having you go and buy a property directly in the market, we abstract the title of that property in an LLC and just have you buy the LLC. And by doing it that way, I, can, I don't have to go through the traditional closing and settlement process. The NFT can be sold on OpenSea or LooksRare or any other marketplace. And the instant that settles on the Ethereum blockchain, you become the new owner of the LLC. So we essentially remove the, all the friction, the time and uh, complexity in a traditional real estate closing process and replaced it with something that r results in instantaneous sale and settlement. Um, on top of that, uh, financing of these investment properties in the US is a huge nightmare as well. Um, if you're a really small scale investor that's just buying his first or second or third rental property, you can actually go through the typical Fannie Mae type financing models. Uh, that's personal credit underwriting based on your salary, your taxes, your bank statements, and all your assets and liabilities. But Fannie Mae does put a limitation on how many properties you can buy as an investment property holder. Uh, and also, as soon as you decide to uh, get some liability protection by titling that asset in a limited liability company, the Fannie Mae financing is no longer available. So just think of how inefficient this market is for a $4 trillion asset class where um, you know, when you buy it, it provides non-correlated um, rental yield. Uh, that goes up annually, so it provides some inflection, uh, in, uh, some protection against inflation. Uh, there is long-term price appreciation. It's non-correlated. Uh, it's a really good asset class to hold as an alternative, but it's a pain to buy and sell them. And uh, especially the transaction cost in the traditional markets could be like seven to seven and a half percent of the value of the property. Which, if you look at it in terms of rental income, that could be like three years or more of rental income that you lose when you sell this property, right? So, a great asset to hold, not so good to buy and sell. And so, we're really trying to simplify all that. And also, by bringing in uh, DeFi financing for these assets on chain, really uh, take away the pain and complexity of getting these funded uh, through traditional leverage channels as well. So, I'll be able to buy this soon. Well, so we, you know, we're coming up with property number three really soon. So if anybody is interested, <laughs> it's uh, in the outskirts of Atlanta, and it's a good rental market. Good city. Hey, the faster you can scale that, the better. I'd love That's to right. buy a home one day, so that would be helpful. <laughs> um, I, and I, I touched on this briefly, so I'll be quick. But I think when when we think about um, digital environmental assets, typically the most common use case is a is a carbon offset, which represents one ton of CO2 removed from the atmosphere. That's the, the most sort of typical asset class we're dealing with in our space. Um, there are some really interesting use cases, though, among our, in our ecosystem. There are, for example, um, one of our partners is taking a section of the Amazon rainforest and converting each acre that they own in the rainforest uh, and tokenizing it into an NFT. And if you buy the NFT, it represents your ownership of that acre of the rainforest, and you can, and they're using NFTs to basically funnel new finance into um, land conservation in Brazil. Um, and it's not only the the assets. I just want to to clarify that that uh, that people are working on in this refi space. It's also kind of the the data layer and the measurement and verification layer. So some folks um, in our ecosystem are also, 
you know, uh, instead of focusing on the tokenization of assets, they're actually looking at how do you use AI and machine learning and drones and sensors to measure how much carbon is being sequestered uh, in one acre of land so that you can actually automate the process for measuring how much carbon is being captured so that it's much easier to scale the uh, carbon market globally because right now one of the main bottlenecks to scaling carbon markets is the fact that it's really hard to measure like how much carbon is actually being captured by all of these projects. You have to send someone out into the field and like, you know, actually measure the soil and things like that. But we have a lot of new technology that we should be leveraging to, to uh, assist in this process and um, that's being, being built as well. And I agree with that in the sense of there's a lot of unknowns uh, that need to be solved. Like something just digitizing a digital bond, like the simplest financial instrument out there. You would think it would be, you know, easy and it's just, you know, the tech part would be the easiest part. And, and the reality of that is you would do, uh, you know, how are you going to pay for, for the bond? What's the cash leg? Are you going to do both the asset and the cash leg on uh, digital? Yes, no. Do you need a QCIP? Um, does it need to be registered? Is, is, is it, what license are you applying for? A crypto license or a securities license? So something that is extremely simple, such as a bond, it still has a lot of uh, questions to be asked. So I'm really, really happy for some of the institutions that are actually pushing forward and going through all those questions with their own compliance and legal teams because for it to become a true uh, digitized uh, real uh, world asset, we still need to solve all these uh, questions. Um, and some are doing it with you know, new products, with new tech, so something that has never been done before and people feel like that might be the easiest path. For example, private equity that, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult to securitize, so then use a new technology to securitize private equity. And in some other cases, it's the other way around. Let's start with the simplest thing, because we haven't yet solved all the necessary uh, requirements and problems that we may face, uh, because we haven't done it before. Um, you know, there was a recent bond issuance by um, EIB, European Investment Bank, mm -hmm. uh, where the, um, the issuance leg for the cash you know, they had Banque de France provided the CBDC, both legs were on digital format, but then the, in two years, there's no visibility as to who could pay the digital leg in two years. Is it gonna be a digital euro? Is it gonna be what? So even that stipulation on two years from now, how am I gonna pay the settlement for that bond was something that we don't know today. But we're pushing the boundaries as to truly making these assets truly digitized uh, and moving them uh, into a, basically a new way of both trading, storing them, um, and in a way will hopefully enable net new assets that were not there to actually be securitized. Well, Marcelo is doing a lot of work in RWA as well, and I was thinking it would be good to get your perspective on what's going on and uh, what, are, what are you guys doing? What are you up to these days? Yeah, sure. So on the way that we've thought about real world assets, a lot of that is comes down to thinking about capital flows, particularly in emerging markets. So, you know, if we look at the flow of funds in the United States or in Europe, capital is able to flow relatively efficiently uh, to a large extent, right? I mean, you still have market failures, you still have market inefficiencies, but capital flows relatively easily. But if you look at other projects, let's say in Kenya or Brazil, if you're thinking about financial flows internationally, that's where it really starts breaking down. And then, so the other thing that you can have when we think of real world assets is, you know, things such as like invoice financing or microfinance, where a lot of that is done in other parts of the world. And you actually have robust loan portfolios and loan books looking at what is the actual like repayment level, the interest rate, everything earned. And so we've been spending a lot of time thinking about kind of those capital flows. So one example is our work with Grameen, which is a large microfinance foundation. And so they have a number of different microfinance institutions all around the world. So they need funding, right? They're getting capital from different places. So what if another way to actually have capital delivered is through stablecoin, through projects like Centrifuge or through Goldfinch or something like that, where you have essentially created borrower pools uh, to be able to borrow. Um, and so that's some of the work that we've been doing, essentially around stablecoins. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, but this is actually kind of my, the one thing I'm wondering here, right? It's down market. Uh, we all like to, sh we all, we're all on crypto. We like to shill everything that we're doing. <laughs> we're always looking for a new savior. Vitalik recently also put, put up an article, I think in December, saying that real world assets are what's going to grow the market. 
What I want to understand here, though, is most of real-world assets that all of us have talked about have involved traditional financial, like traditional entities, right? For either climate finance or even just traditional finance, these are large institutions that move large volumes of capital. Why blockchain? Like, what's the real solution that a blockchain technology as a tech stack really provides if you're dealing with traditional institutions in which you might actually be able to use any type of centralized execution? So I'll let anyone kind of take yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, I, I can start off and then... Um, so, again, purely looking from, um, again, the single-family rental asset class, right? Um, about 85 to 86 percent of all these rental properties are owned by people that have one to ten homes. And then when you start looking at the people that have 11 to 50, that's another few percent. And then 50 to 200 is a few more. And then when you start looking at how many individuals or entities own more than 200 properties, that's like 2 or 3%. And the primary reason for that is, as we talked about, financing in TradFi for this asset class has always been very inefficient. So you can easily scale up to 10, um, but then after that, you kind of there's this huge chasm where there's um, big banks that will work with you once you scale up to 500 properties or something, right? And you're looking at growing a book to, say, $200 million and then securitizing it, um, words that we've been using quite a bit today. But um, for a guy that wants to go from 10 properties to 50, there's no really uh, good solutions for them. They either uh, are really lucky and have some community banking relationships where they're able to create a bespoke program for themselves, or they're looking at non-bank lenders, which are mostly private money or hard money lending, and the interest rates there are um, way too high for the cap rate this asset class generally produces, and um, so it, you, know, you end up in a negative leverage scenario. It's not really uh, useful to get that kind of leverage, so you end up in this sort of uh, you know, dead land where you know, once you get to 500 units, Goldman Sachs will talk to you, but you know, when you're <laughs> getting number 11, there's nobody to talk to you at that point, right? So we do think that DeFi can solve that problem efficiently. Like what these guys are doing at Centrifuge with, you know, bringing down securitization to a much smaller scale, um, where instead of requiring $250 million of assets to go through a securitization, you create a 10 or $20 million pool, and essentially you're able to figure out a way to get that capital um, Ultimately, the reason for doing all this is to find cheap permanent capital. And if they're able to find that cheaper permanent capital at a smaller scale, that's solving a real problem in, in DeFi that otherwise is really hard to solve in TradFi. So from my perspective, and I think you probably have the same. Uh, yeah. But, I mean, no, definitely. I think the best way to share the example of where I think like, the opportunity is, is you take something as simple as real estate, like a single owned like, real estate property, right? A rental property in Atlanta, for example, and you then talk about what it actually takes to get financing for that, talk about doing that at multiple times, doing it at scale, doing it at the level of where you know, your society can start actually benefiting from this. Uh, the complexity is insane at the end of it, right? I always love when Sanjay speaks because I start very simply at like owning a house and then next thing I know I'm in negative leverage scenarios <laughs> and I'm trying to figure out which way is up, right? And I think that's really where the magic of blockchain technology comes in because you can build on new technology stacks that are transparent, highly connected, they're verifiable, right? which are incredible benefits in the financial perspective. But you can use kind of traditional financial techniques that we've actually been doing for 2,000 years. And yes, they may have been misapplied, and right, and maybe greed has taken over somewhere along the way. But we can kind of re-engineer all that stuff back onto a more transparent, more verifiable, more efficient tech stack. And I think that then starts to unlock stuff at the smaller levels, and you get away from kind of capital con concentration at the top, right? No, you, I must. No, you must feel the same way, Carlos. Your background, working with all the financial institutions, you've seen the dirty side of it, right? It has been uh, a slow process, I think, for financial institutions to actually uh, adopt, uh, and primarily because they they have a mode, they have a way to actually restrict, uh, you know, some of new entrants, uh, and also they hold uh, you know massive uh, amounts of capital. At the same time, the need for transformation and what has happened in regards to financial innovation through crypto is something that they're finally um, you know, taking a very, very um, uh, consistent look, let's say, because there was a lot of like false starts. I think five years ago, there was a lot of people that did a lot of POCs and never moved forward. 
Uh, now there is no longer the convincing that needs to happen to senior management to actually uh, leverage that technology. They know the momentum, they know that that's where they need to get to. So how do you, you actually get there? I think for um, large banks, uh, what they've done is they categorize it as enterprise use cases. So those would be like the securitization or tokenization of you know, good old financial instruments. They're doing crypto, but they're doing crypto in a very weird way through investments or through um, derivatives or through uh, not direct investment into crypto. As soon as there is regulatory clarity, they will get into that. And then I think they have a third area, which is just investments. So even though they're not actively using some of these technologies, they have been investing in all of it for about two to three years. Uh, and at some point, they'll incorporate those technologies into uh, the financial institution, uh, financial institution, but they're waiting for uh, additional regulatory clarity. So I think the movement and the, the, the inertia is there for them to get there, uh, but it took them a while, a really long time, and also a lot of false starts on things that were never to be developed all the way into production. It was just a little bit of testing here and there. I, I'd also add that it's only in the last few years we've seen smart contracts and programmable money, meaning stable coins, come together in a very specific way that allows these things to happen. So five years back when people were attempting this, you know, you didn't have USDC before 2018 or whenever it came, right? And so some of these problems were harder to solve when the infrastructure was still being built out in Web3. But I think today we have those necessary pieces. So like you pointed out, I think this next wave, um, you know, we're all optimistic we're going to see more of it. Yeah, traditional exchanges by their own bylaws couldn't trade digital securities, period. They were banned. So now you have, you know, exchanges that, or digital exchanges that created on their own, but also you have like a SDX in Switzerland, which is, a, you know, an, a, an entity that was uh, created out of six because the bylaws of six wouldn't allow digital assets. So now you have an entity that can trade digital assets, which is owned by the same people, but it took, um, uh, took them a while to actually get those bylaws changed and allow themselves to actually uh, trade digital assets. That same entity is having the issue today that if you have a bond or an equity, is it fungible between the traditional and digital? Do you have the same QCIP or registry number? Um, and, and those are things that, again, we're, we're, we're learning as we go, given that you know, we didn't have that problem in the past. And just one maybe slightly different spin on it before circling back to the, the, the kind of value that the blockchain brings that you all just talked about. Um, I think when it comes to carbon markets, a huge issue is trust and transparency. Um, I don't know if you all have seen John Oliver's segment on carbon offsets, but uh, he doesn't paint them in a very good light. There's, there's a, an issue with you know, transparency and, and potential, potential fraud. You know, it depends on how, how um, much you believe the, the FUD. But um, trust and transparency are super important to run an effective carbon marketplace. and to actually get capital to projects on the ground that are actually making an impact to conserve important and valuable natural resources. And so digitizing it and making it entirely transparent from start to finish increases visibility, increases transparency, and, and increases trust. That's, that's the idea. Um, the, the second value add of blockchain is that it allows for access to new capital. So, um, if the if you know if individual consumers anyone who has a wallet decides to offset their their carbon emissions because they you know they feel guilty about a, a plane flight or something like that um, you know you could you could check the box that one of the airlines gives you on your purchase which you know it, it is maybe not powered by blockchain or you could go into a voluntary carbon market where you can actually you know buy an asset that represents a, a real world. Um, you know, spot of trees or something that you actually um, know what you're getting when you buy it. And then lastly, to kind of circle back to what you all were just talking about, um, it, it makes it easier for not just finance to flow into natural capital projects, but also for projects to onboard into the space. So um, if we, the idea is, is that if, if the entire system is decentralized and transparent and there's a global uh, marketplace for carbon, then anyone who is living in an area where they feel that they can actually turn their plot of land, whether it's a farm or just a kind of forgotten lot, should be able to 
uh, register their land on a global decentralized database and actually get access to financing through carbon markets. And blockchain would allow us to kind of scale to a point where anyone could sign up and actually get on without having to go through a corporate intermediary to, to, to get onto a marketplace, which is how it's worked in the past. And so that increased access, I think, is a, is a huge part of the value of blockchain as well. Yeah, and the thing I can add here too, so Solo does a lot of work on climate finance as well, work closely with the Climate Collective. Another just even basic example here is just from a pricing standpoint. If you're looking to buy a carbon credit asset, normally you might have to go to essentially a broker in which you actually don't know how that price is being set. But this is where even like a normal DEX model is really helpful because you can see what pricing is. It's highly efficient. You can see the transaction volume. You can see all of it. And then, of course, you can add all these additional components, right? So the traceability, where is that asset coming from? Where is it originating? All of those things. But even just from a basic outset of pricing, having it on a DEX is really helpful for that. I want to be cognizant of time and see if folks in the audience have questions as well. My question goes for the whole panel, but specifically you, is what are your thoughts on uh, a, a token voting DAP platform being used in central government governance? A, a token voting platform being used in central government con con context? Um, I'm not sure what, what exactly like you're trying to get at with the question. Maybe uh, uh, help to clarify a little bit. Like central government being like governance, generally speaking? Or like yeah, so like... Right now, if I want to go vote, I'm limited to what I can vote on within the government. There's so many more aspects of the U.S. government's governance that is limited to the uh, to people that are voted into that system. So, uh, what are your thoughts on using a DAP token voting platform? Because there's tons of those out there that I know you use, but uh, like using that in central government, central government governance, so how that could be used in the future. Yeah, I think it's a, you know, I can't say, there's actually examples I know of, right? I live in Washington, D.C., the DeFi politician, it all, well, all makes sense, right? Um, and, and there's a ton of examples where voting has been used and like to kind of solve this problem, like blockchain-based voting. I think the trust and transparency and like the verifiability part of it is kind of big. You know, I'd also encourage another way to think about this, because Centrifuge is going through the process of becoming a proper DAO. And the way we look at this is, you know, we're kind of a private entity, right, that's trying to solve this problem of creating credit infrastructure on chain. You know, it's not just interesting to, to us, at least, to just revolutionize finance. We want to revolutionize the way finance is governed. And so that really is about then how can you use these token voting systems to kind of recreate this, like, management model that allows maybe a little more fluidity and, like, better decision making to happen. So those are the things I think about when I hear that question. I'm not sure if anyone else has an answer. I think uh, hypothetically it makes sense, right? Because when you're voting for a specific party, you're basically voting for all of the agenda of that yeah. one party. You may be, uh, for example, you may be liberal on certain issues, but you may be, you know, fiscally you may be conservative, but on social policies you may be liberal. And if you had the opportunity to vote on every policy matter, then uh, the, the people would be much better represented, I think. So as a concept, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I, mean, I think DAO governance is like a big experiment in how do you, you know, kind of change the model of voting, voter incentives and things like that. And you know, it's, it's certainly an interesting design space that I think goes underrepresented or underappreciated. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for your time. So I'm sure you're familiar that MakerDAO is trying to limit its exposure to RWAs, I think 25% cap of um, total collateral that it has. I think it's at 10% right now, yet it's, it generates 50% of the revenues. So I'm just curious what your guys' thoughts were on that. Like, is 25% too high, too low? And if too low, is there a potential market uh, for like a new type of maker DAO that just focuses on RWAs? I would love to answer this. <laughs> so we've, we've worked with Maker for a long time on uh, you know, bringing real world assets to them and still work with them very closely to this day. Uh, I think the challenges Maker has, to be very specific, is they have a big like, liquidity challenge, right? They're a collateralized stable coin, so there has to be some collateral value that backs DAI. But then you have this issue is when 
die balances, you know, the balance of die, the overall issuance, contracts or you know, goes down for some reason, something happens, right? Uh, you have to kind of adjust the total supply. That's like the biggest constraint maker has. And so that actually makes real world assets very difficult for them to onboard because it introduces this whole liquidity and duration mismatch. And you know, the guys at MakerDAO, the strategic finance core unit are working really hard on solving that problem. And I think you know, there are other perspectives as well that ultimately real world asset collateral introduces these like centralization risks. So I think 25% you know, is probably a reasonable space for Maker to be in, in terms of their own perspective. I think other stable coins definitely have an opportunity to kind of disrupt this market. You know, they have to solve challenges like liquidity, but I think all of us who are working in the space today is really an amazing way to like look at, okay, there's so many financing needs out there. How can I kind of change the way I'm sourcing financing capital and then allow that to be flowed to productive use cases? I think that's really it. So like Ave Go is launching soon. Uh, I'm be pretty pretty loud on the forums over there that I think real world assets will be be a big part of that protocol, and um, I, I do I, I think that I believe that because I think it's a huge opportunity that's left undressed. I mean, it's really interesting, right? Because um, makers' cost of capital is literally zero, right? It or so low that um, you can do a deal with them at whatever three percent, four percent type uh, rates. So everybody in DeFi is obviously salivating over that as a prospect, right? And then so when they go and do half a billion dollars of treasury, they're like, okay, that's our WA, but we were really hoping that money would be allocated to us. But at the end of the day, I think, you know, Maker is a DAO. The DAO is going to determine how much capital they're going to invest in what types of assets. We're, uh, everybody should not just be dependent on Maker, right? We've got to find a way to bring TradFi capital into this and really bridge that gap, because otherwise there's going to be two parallel economies, one in TradFi and one in DeFi, and that's really not long run. I don't think it's good for either side. We have to find a convergence. Hi. Uh, as a DeFi user, uh, and I've explored real world asset lending protocols, Goldfinch, Maple, one of the things that, that's uh, troubled me is understanding the risk levels of those investments. So they, they say it's a 10, 12% yield and you know, no defaults or whatever. How do I know that's a good rate of return? And so as more and more assets go on chain and it's exposed to everyday investors around the world, uh, there's no professional underwriting there. There's no uh, asset managers saying, yes, those small business loans or the, the housing, that's a good risk, it's well-priced. How do we deal with that problem? To, yeah, so to make this take off? I come from the traditional kind of you know, investment banking space and all that, and I've always sort of thought about Equity roughly in the U.S. is about a 12% you know, rate of return. Debt is lower than that. So when you find debt products that provide more than equity, generally alarm bells start ringing for me, right? So um, I was on a call with um, the folks from uh, Anchor Protocol like a couple of years back, and they were like you know, selling their 19% return or something. And I was like, these returns are not possible. Like there's something you're not telling us. And they were like, no, 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 it's, you know, yeah, we've been doing this, uh, it might come down by half a percent, but it's gonna be fine. And I was like, heck, you know, like all the years in TradFi have taught us that this is not sustainable, right? And sure enough, uh, you know, we, we saw that collapse. And then we saw the same happen with Celsius and BlockFi and Voyager and 3AC and FTX and everything. My, uh, you know, if, it's, if it sounds unreal, it probably is, is my, my hypo hypothesis on this. Um, Generally, for debt products, you should be looking for debt kind of returns, which, um, you know, you can look at uh, high yield bonds and see what they're returning. And maybe for private credit, you can add another 300, 400 basis points on top of that for illiquidity. But that's kind of how I would look at debt returns. I'll just add that to do that due diligence is hard sometimes. And to have the transparency and the clarity as to what you're truly investing in is not, we haven't done a good job, I think. Uh, in regards to how we should uh, offer those products and truly um, detail, but also risk adjust uh, those products as uh, things change. And one other related challenge too is for a lot of kind of, I think for some of the smaller DeFi projects that say they're doing real world lending, the interest rates are not clear either, right? Because the capital that they can have flowing in could actually just be coming from a layer one blockchain foundation uh, that was provided a 0% interest rate loan. Uh, purely for BD purposes, which is a challenging environment because you actually don't know if it's like, oh, our, we have $5 million of loans outstanding, but you don't know if the $5 million came from an investor or if it just came from a foundation. 
And I'd seen plenty of that where a project would come in and say, we're gonna do real world lending. And I was like, okay, great. So who do you have as your capital providers? They said, you. And I was like, we're a foundation. We're not, we're not set up to provide this. So I was like, we can do due diligence. Like I can do that. I have a few team members who can, but that's not our purpose. So that's another, I think, dice, that's another dicey part. Yeah. I'll, I'll, so I think it's a really challenge, the big challenge we all face here is actually addressing this uh, complexity that exists in finance inherently and trying to bridge that gap, right? At Centrifuge, one of the ways we think about it is, can we just make kind of sound financial products where the asset's actually brought on chain and tokenized and that then has, provides legal recourse to investors and like we're very proud to be able to offer that in the platform and it is all tokenized and you can kind of see that on the app today. You know, that's one way to do it, but that's still not solving the problem. How do you actually do the underwriting and, and that type of work? This is where I think DAOs are really interesting actually. If you look at Goldfinch, Credits, you know, Maple, us, right? Everyone wants to solve the problem of underwriting in a decentralized format. I think it's kind of, even like in traditional finance, if you actually look at what they're trying to solve with rating agencies, it's the holy grail, I think, of, of finance, right? We launched something recently called the Credit Group, where we take kind of a, you know, outside resources, experts from MakerDAO, experts from other, uh, you know, TradFi institutions as well, and we're trying to offer that within our DAO as like a service that can perform some of the underwriting, provide these objective opinion, but that's only one step in the process, right? It's extremely hard, right? Because uh, even in, in these models, like Goldfinch, for example, lends to fintechs that then on lends to the borrower. Um, there's like, you have uh, underwriting small businesses is extremely hard because nobody does the balance sheet exactly the same way. Like you might record something in, you know, one ledger entry and somebody else is doing it differently. So you need, uh, it's very hard to decentralize that and just automate it. You need somebody that's, really a forensic expert in looking at financial statements, asking the right questions, and then trying to figure out is there any accounting ab uh, abnormality that you need to solve for before you can establish credit, right? And a lot of these smaller companies, they don't have audited financials. There's really no way to know if it's right or wrong. So it's, it's a, it is a very challenging task to undertake, um, even by humans, and it's extremely hard to do it uh, automated. Yeah, I have, one, I have a question. Um, when it comes to NFTs, uh, do you see any other way that we can start to adopt them in terms of like maybe like a car title or like uh, maybe a, a property deed or maybe even patents one day, maybe integrating like royalties and stuff like that? Uh, so pro property deed, I can answer that. Um, but deeds are recorded in counties right now and to bring that uh, onto the blockchain. Obviously, if you can put title on the blockchain, you can look at all the liens and encumbrances. It's, it simplifies everything for everybody, opens up capital markets. But that's gonna take legislative change because states will have to opt in and then counties within states will have to opt into that. And you know, so that, I don't see that happening in, in you know, next several years at least uh, in the US because you can almost think of it as 50 little jurisdictions that then have you know, 100 little jurisdictions each, and you have to kind of map through all that, right? Uh, but the way we have solved that problem is by abstracting the title and putting it into an LLC, and that's what allows us to use NFT specifically to trade these assets instantaneously. Uh, but having said that, I think IP rights, royalties, uh, you can pretty much put any of those types of cash flowing assets or assets that have cash flow potential or revenue potential, uh, and you, you can put those in NFTs now. Doing some of those, uh, while an NFT itself is not a security, uh, depending on how the, the scheme is structured, can actually render that to be an investment contract under US securities laws and make that a security. And if it's a security, you can no longer trade it on OpenSea because then OpenSea would be considered an unlicensed broker dealer that's taking a commission on the trade, right? So there's a lot of complexity to unravel. While the technology is capable of solving these issues and you may be able to uh, find a way to do it in a compliant manner. It's also possible to structure something that inadvertently becomes an investment contract and security. Every uh, loan on Centrifuge actually is represented as an NFT today. I mean, Sanjay did the, the topic justice. It's incredibly hard to do with like real veracity, but that's how the platform is designed. And hopefully, the laws will change that allow NFTs to be created from financial collateral more easily. But that's a, maybe a future that's a couple years away still. Yeah, and then also for climate finance as well. It's, you can issue an NFT and have that as like, over time the rewards that are coming out can actually be the carbon credit asset because you issue the NFT in advance and then from there you're able to then provide that as return because you've essentially provided a forward, a forward agreement 
But again, then it becomes dicey from a security standpoint. So hopefully you went to the earlier talk by Commissioner <laughs> Hester Pierce. I think Kevin Werbach also gave a talk two panels before, so hopefully you went to that one. And so with that, we are out of time. Um, thank you so much for thank you so much for joining. Thank you to all the panelists as well.